Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bobby Schnabel, uh, the external chair of the computer science department at CU Boulder. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar, which is part of our celebration of the 50th anniversary of the computer science department. Uh, we already have, let's see, over 200 people who've joined us, uh, including CU students, faculty and staff, alumni, tech community members, and more. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I should mention that a number of you submitted questions with your registration. You can also enter them in that thing that says Q&A uh, right under the uh, webinar uh, at any time during the webinar. I should also apologize in advance that we already have considerably more questions than we'll get to, so sorry if we don't get to yours. Uh, we're delighted to have with us today Professor Tammy Sumner, Professor of Computer Science, Director of the Institute of Cognitive Science and a two-time CU alum, and former CU Boulder Computer Science and Institute of Cognitive Science professors Mike Mosier and Paul Smolensky, both of whom, as you know, are world-leading researchers in neural nets and deep learning. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tammy, who will moderate. Thank you, Bobby. It is very fitting that this 50th anniversary series is launched with a panel on neural networks and deep learning. CU Boulder played a critical role in nurturing this field through our early faculty investments in neural networks and their applications to cognitive science research. This was enabled by the long-standing partnership between the Department of Computer Science and the Institute of Computer Science. And this partnership enabled us to successfully recruit Professors Moser and Smolensky, our speakers today, and to create a unique space that allowed their cutting edge and in interdisciplinary research to grow and flourish. So without further ado, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists and then we can begin. Michael Moser served for 30 years as a professor in the Department of Computer Science in the Institute of Cognitive Science. He recently joined Google Brain as a research scientist. Mike is also the secretary of the Neural Information Processing Systems Foundation and a former chair of the Cognitive Science Society. Mike is interested in human-centric artificial intelligence. This involves designing machine learning methods that leverage insights from human cognition and building machine learning based software tools that help people better learn, remember, and make decisions. Paul Smolensky was a professor in the Department of Computer Science in the Institute of Cognitive Science here at CU Boulder for nine years before joining Johns Hopkins University in 1994, where he was a professor in their Department of Cognitive Science. Since 2016, he has also served as a partner researcher in the deep learning group at Microsoft Research. Paul's research has pursued, pursued the unification of symbolic and neural computation. For this, he received the fifth David E. Romo Hart Prize for outstanding contributions to the formal analysis of human cognition. So congratulations, Paul. Okay, with that, Mike and Paul are going to kick off our discussion with a short presentation. I am going to go first. Have, is my screen visible to the world? Awesome. Uh, and Paul's going to give another presentation. We're aiming for about 10 minutes apiece and then spend the rest of the time having a conversation. Uh, so I wanted to start go back. Uh, I know there's some people in the audience who don't have a background and know the whole history of this field. Um, and so I just wanted to start by going way back to um, the earliest days of neural networks. And I made a timeline here to anchor the major events. And I want to start back in a year that, um, well, it was particularly significant to me. It was my birth year. Um, it was also the year that Frank Rosenblatt wrote an article in Psychological Review. Rosenblatt was a psychologist. The article was called The Perceptron, a Probabilistic Model for Information Storage and Organization in the Brain. And for folks who don't have a background in machine learning, this is my one slide introduction to machine learning. The promise of the algorithm that he proposed called the Perceptron is that you 
show the system a set of examples that are labeled as A's and B's or positives and negatives, and you feed it into the system, and it comes out and says, yes, that's a, a positive example, or no, it's not a positive example. And you reward the system when it gets the right answer. And this black box learns to classify A's versus B's from the examples. So it programs itself from, from, uh, from examples. The amazing thing in this article and in, in his research was that he showed mathematically that a perceptron can learn anything it can be programmed to do. So you don't have to program it by hand, you can let it do learning. That caused lots of excitement in probably the first real uh, wave of excitement in machine learning until about a decade later, a book appeared by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert called Perceptrons that did a really nice theoretical computer science analysis looking at scaling properties and um, computability. And they showed that there are many things that a perceptron can't learn to do, both in principle and in practice. That killed the field. And there was the first real neural net winter where there wasn't much rationale for working with neural nets because everyone knew that Minsky and Papper had showed their limitations. Um, the only people who were foolish enough to go off and still play around with neural nets were uh, clueless psychologists, including these folks at UC San Diego, Don Norman and Jay McClellan and Dave Rumelhart. And uh, Don on the left there is one of the founders of the field of cognitive science. And he hosted the first cognitive science conference at UCSD in 1979. Uh, Jay and Dave, founded a group called the PDP group. PDP stood for Parallel Distributed Processing. And uh, they decided to look at neural networks as mainly as a psychological model. Is it a reasonable theory of, of how our um, cognitive systems work? Their group involved, it, it became a large group and they invited postdocs to come out for a few years. Their first postdoc was this fellow named Jeff Hinton. I tried to find old photos of everyone, uh, but that's the oldest one I could find of Jeff. Um, and then a year later, another fellow named Paul Smolensky showed up. And uh, I also started grad school at UCSD at the same time. And the PDP group was very productive during the 80s and built cognitive models, mostly using neural networks of a bunch of phenomena. And um, the, the kind of highlight of the whole era was this paper that came out from Dave Rumelhart and Jeff Hinton and um, a postdoc named Ron Williams called Learning Representations by Backpropagating Errors. I'm going to actually read you the abstract because I think, again, for folks who, if there's anyone in the audience who doesn't have a machine learning background, it will explain to you a little bit about what's going on. The abstract says, we describe a new learning procedure, backpropagation, for networks of neuron-like units. The procedure repeatedly adjusts the weights of the connections in a network so as to minimize a measure of the difference between the actual output vector of the net and the desired output vector. As a result of the weight adjustments, internal hidden units, which are not part of the input or output, come to represent important features of the task domain, and the regularities in the task are captured by the interactions of these units. The ability to create useful new features distinguishes backpropagation from earlier simple methods, such as the perceptron convergence procedure. So what they showed was they could overcome this sort of fundamental limitation of perceptrons, and that led to a, another wave of excitement about neural networks. And this time the field was branded as connectionism in the sense that uh, the knowledge is in the connections among neurons. Uh, many cognitive scientists were excited about this as the Cognitive Science Society got off the ground. The CogSci conference was a hotbed of work in this area. Um, and, and 
AI and machine learning people started to get wind of, of the field as well. And um, it caught their interest. And many of these machine learning folks were uh, very strong mathematicians. And they developed more principled, mathematically speaking, more principled methods like support vector machines and Bayesian approaches. And neural nets fell out of favor, partly because they weren't the hot thing of the week, um, but partly because, again, there was some nice theoretical foundations for these other approaches. And neural nets just seemed like a hacker's universe. Um, or in the early 2010s, neural nets reappeared. A uh, new generation of folks got excited about them. It was branded this time as deep learning. And Jeff is, Jeff Hinton is both the father and the grandfather of deep learning. So what happened in this period of 15 to 20 years between connectionism and deep learning? There was definitely a time in there where neural nets were way out of favor that if you looked in a machine learning conference, uh, someone did an analysis of what keywords predicted acceptance or rejection of a paper. And the two top keywords that projected, predicted rejection were neural and network. So uh, what happened during this time? Well, among other things, computers got a lot faster and data sets got a lot larger thanks to the internet. And software tools evolved for doing neural networks, things like TensorFlow and PyTorch, JAX emerged. Um, and then there's some special sauce, some new insights, methods, and architectures that uh, people developed in part because there's so many people working in the field now um, that have really changed the game. Some of these bits of special sauce have to do with a theoretical understanding of why and when over-parameterized models generalize well. Uh, there are a bunch of new practical tricks to getting deep neural networks with many layers of hidden units to train. And there's new forms of inductive bias and architectural constraints. And I believe Paul is going to focus on one particularly interesting such development that he's made some very important contributions to. Um, and I'll say more too about specific ideas that I think are hot ideas if we circle back. To finish up, I just want to revisit the timeline from a Colorado-centric perspective. And I'm going to jump way back to when Paul arrived in Boulder, I think 1985. Uh, he came as an assistant professor in computer science, uh, came from UCSD. His hire, as Tammy mentioned, was encouraged and supported by the Institute of Cognitive Science. In 1988, I came to Boulder as an assistant professor uh, rostered in COGSI with a home department in CS, much to the dismay of real computer scientists. And in 1988, we had the first Neural Information Processing Systems Conference, a conference that was devoted to neural nets for machine learning. It was held in Colorado at the Denver Tech Center. Um, it was a week-long event. There were tutorials, conference, workshops. The workshops were in the mountains and people went skiing so that the workshops were held from 7 to 10 in the morning and 4 to 7 at night, and people skied during the daytime. In 1993, we, Paul and uh, I and a few other folks, hosted the Connectionist model summer school. There were two summer schools before ours, and between the three of these summer schools, ours was the last. Um, most of the senior researchers in the field today attended one or the other, either as faculty or as students. I was a student in the 86 summer school. Paul and I had a group called the Boulder Connectionist Research Group. This was us in our heyday. Um, you can see there's Paul on the right, and there's me in front, and Dave Rumelhart was visiting us that time, and I think Patrick Lynn chimed in on chat, and Kevin Markey uh, is also in chat, and apologies if there's others of you who are here. Uh, those are the folks who I know about right now. Um, we had a sort of unique character of the group that did neural networks in Boulder, that we had these very strong connections to cognitive science. Paul was a linguist and philosopher. 
primarily. Paul, Paul's in everything, but he views himself as a linguist and philosopher. Um, myself, Eliana, Yuko Munakata in psychology, we're uh, interested more from a psychological perspective and Randy O'Reilly from more from a neuroscience perspective, but we all had connections between neural nets and cognitive science. Uh, we had a group t-shirt, which I'm wearing. It's not just that I'm a slob, even though I am a slob. And uh, I just wanted to explain the t-shirt. So Paul had developed a framework called Harmony Theory. And like many algorithms in neural networks and machine learning, it involves optimization, finding a maximum of a function. And this function Paul called Harmony. And uh, you can see the function is kind of outlined by the peaks of the mountains here. And like many, Learning, fun, learning methods or, or neural net methods, uh, a lot of these methods perform local optimization. So they get to a local optimizer and they get stuck there. So we made, uh, we started off with specific universities, but we made it more generic, East Coast, Canada, West Coast. And uh, it's worn off of my shirt, but boulders up here on top and there's a little guy climbing the mountains. So uh, that was our uh, official group. And uh, unfortunately, Paul left for new adventures in uh, the mid 90s. And um, the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference finally moved on from Colorado. I did my best to keep it in Colorado so that students could take the week off and come down to the conference. And um, then I headed off in 2018. Here, I found a couple old posters from the early days of the conference. There is uh, the Colorado mountains in the background. I think I was program chair one of these years. I'm not sure. Uh, and just to give you a feel for sort of what's happening in the field, if, if you aren't paying attention by any chance, um, here's attendance at Neural Information Processing Systems. I, again, there's sort of different registrations for tutorials, conference, and workshops. This is from 2001 to 2020. Um, in 2020, there were 23,500 participants altogether. There's a large number of industry participants, but um, from the way the registration system is kind of restricted, because we have to limit registration, um, more than half of the academic, more than half of the industry presenters, or uh, sorry, more than half of the industry attendees are researchers in industry as well. There's a lot of research going on in industry as, as um, Paul and my affiliations reflect. Um, the conference has over 150 sponsors and uh, press coverage, and we have a year round uh, PR firm that deals with um, the press. So the field has gotten super hot and I'm not sure how long it will last. That would be a good thing to discuss. I don't have an answer, uh, but that's where we're at right now. <coughs> And let me, let me throw in that, uh, was it 2019, you may remember, um, uh, the registration was online um, and people were warned that it was probably going to fill up, so you probably don't want to delay. Uh, and the entire conference sold out in 11 and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah, we caught a lot of flack for that. So I'll turn things over to Paul. Good transition. Okay. Uh, so you can see and hear me now, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to pick up on uh, the theme that Mike mentioned about uh, something that was really uniquely characteristic of the Colorado Neural Network's uh, work um, in the extent it was heavily engaged with cognitive science and supported by ICS. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the department, thank ICS, for making it possible for me to have an academic career at all by being willing to hire somebody who did not have a degree in computer science, um, was anxious about the fact that he couldn't probably pass the preliminary exams if he had to, uh, but uh, found that at Colorado in both ICS and uh, computer science, I was made very welcome and very much at home and it was a very, very fruitful environment to work in. And for that, I will always be grateful. Um, <clears throat> So as Mike mentioned, um, uh, in our research group, we uh, did work on 
problems in psychology, explaining uh, phenomena in human visual perception uh, was uh, one of the fields that Mike uh, contributed heavily to. Um, there was work on linguistics, um, symbolic theories of grammar, in fact, uh, that arose out of neural computing uh, for language. And <clears throat> a work in philosophy concerning uh, the problem of compositionality, providing a general solution uh, to how to get compositionality into neural networks. Um, this was through a, a device called tensor product representations, which will be mentioned once or twice again. Um, <clears throat> but I wanna elaborate on what I mean by compositionality and why it's so important. Uh, compositional representations support compositional processing and yield compositional generalization. Compositional generalization is something that's profoundly important uh, in cognition, uh, but very challenging to achieve with neural computing. Um, so let me um, explain what I mean by these various terms. So compositional representations you're all very familiar with from uh, all sorts of symbolic um, uh, systems of expressions like algebra, arithmetic, um, or trees uh, for parsing natural language. Um, and these support compositional processing uh, in the way that's very familiar in computer science. So we can take this constituent, evaluate it, uh, this constituent evaluate it, pass the results to bigger constituents, which again can be evaluated and so on. Um, uh, that's compositional processing. Uh, and the same thing is uh, possible with language. Now we're translating into uh, meaning representation using say the Lambda calculus. And I'm gonna skip all the gory details and just say that the same thing happens, but now we're building a symbolic expression of meaning rather than evaluating a number. Um, <clears throat> uh, and what I mean by saying that uh, this yields compositional generalization is that knowing how to do this means we can evaluate any well-formed algebraic expression. Um, we can take uh, expressions we've never seen before and break them down and see them as compositions of familiar um, parts that we have seen before and that we know how to process. And the same thing is true here. We can interpret any grammatical sentence using this compositional processing mechanism. Um, so that's very powerful composition generalization. And as I say, that's something that neural networks are struggling to uh, master. <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> uh, let me drill down a little bit onto language, which is really the area that I um, work in. <clears throat> um, compositional representations have always been crucial in formal studies of language uh, going back thousands of years. Um, but neural networks have been remarkably successful in language processing in the last several years, especially. Uh, they've achieved amazing successes um, and that either means that um, the neural nets don't have compositional representations. They just have these vector representations of activations over neurons. Um, but that in fact, compositional representations uh, are not crucial for doing language processing well, um, which contradicts all prior work uh, for thousands of years on language. Um, <clears throat> or uh, they do have compositional representations, um, despite uh, all appearances to the contrary. Um, <clears throat> now, which of these is really most important? Uh, I don't know yet. We don't know yet. Um, uh, both are at work, for sure. Uh, for example, we know that uh, if you take a very compositional function to teach uh, a network, even a simple plain neural network, um, if you give it enough data showing all the compositional po possibilities, then it actually learns to make its own internal representations that have compositional structure. They in fact turn out to be TPRs, the solution to how to embed uh, compositional structure in neural networks that I mentioned earlier. Um, so it's possible for networks to discover this, but they have to be given a lot of data to do it. Um, <clears throat> now, in recent years, the big um, uh, burst of success uh, has largely been due to the transformer architecture. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on the aspects of this architecture. The, the important point for, for now is that it provides material uh, with which the network can learn compositional representations. Um, essentially, 
what the machine can do is for any given input string of symbols, uh, it can build a, a graph for data flow that's appropriate for that input to direct um, the uh, information flow uh, in a dynamic way. Um, and that is a kind of, that graph is a kind of compositional representation uh, which has uh, afforded quite a lot of additional power. Um, <clears throat> I said that compositional representations have always been crucial for formal studies of language, but discrete structures have almost always proved to be too limiting. So compositional representations uh, are important, but if you realize them discreetly, you run into a lot of uh, limitations. Um, so what this provides is an opportunity for neural networks now to be doing compositional representations that are not discrete. <clears throat> so to pop up a little bit, um, what we can take from cognitive science here is that language and lots of other cognitive uh, capacities require representations that are continuous vectors. We've learned that from the power of vectors in uh, even in language processing where things seem more symbolic than anything else. Uh, and we need compositional structures to get good compositional generalization. Um, so if we take that as a set of uh, principles from cognitive science to try to use to govern our uh, AI construction, then one thing you can do um, is to have a neural component that provides you the continuous vectors, the symbolic component that provides you symbolic uh, discrete compositional structures. This is a kind of hybrid systems. Um, that is one uh, part of the field that is now very, uh, uh, very well studied in many different ways, uh, neurosymbolic computation. Um, you can think about a sort of prototypical case as a symbolic program in which some of the internal functions are not computed by symbolic computation, they're computed by a neural network. Um, and uh, if you're interested in hearing more about this, um, the uh, plenary uh, address by Henry Kautz at the most recent AAAI conference was devoted entirely to neurosymbolic computation and um, uh, laying out the space of different ways that it's being pursued in the field. Uh, another approach though, is to have one type of representation that is simultaneously continuous and compositional. Um, that's neurocompositional computation, where the vectors uh, themselves have a kind of internal compositional structure that's appropriate for vector space relationships as opposed to discrete space. Um, and transformers uh, exemplify this to a limited degree. And I think that a lot of the power results from that fact. Um, another kind of neurosymbolic system uh, is a graph network where you have a graph, a discrete structure. Um, the structure is discrete, but at the nodes you have vectors that uh, encode uh, information that gets communicated along the edges. Um, this is very well suited to doing uh, to working in formal domains that have discrete structure uh, exactly, such as computer programs. So program synthesis, many games have this property and a lot of progress has been made by hooking together uh, uh, discrete and a structure with continuous content. Um, but this other approach, the neural compositional approach um, uh, makes not just the content, but the structure as well continuous, uh, which makes it, uh, suitable for non-formal domains like language, where hopefully you can overcome the limitations that discrete compositional structures have always uh, carried with them for the study of language and conceptual knowledge in many other fields. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, why uh, is this notion of continuous structure particularly uh, promising? Well, um, we have learned about the tremendous power of vector representations, the whole uh, burst of success in natural language processing uh, was kicked off when people stopped using symbols to represent words and started using vectors to represent words and sentences and many, many other things now. Uh, so that has proved enormously powerful. Um, and so the idea is to apply this to structure itself uh, where structural relations are no longer discrete either, um, but they are vectors in a continuous space. And what this can allow neural networks to do is to have deep learning invent its own kinds of compositional representations and processes, uh, which will of course be continuous 
uh, compositional representations because it's all done within uh, neural computation. Um, so that was just a glimpse of some of the um, current trends in uh, natural language processing uh, viewed from a cognitive science perspective um, as appropriate for a celebration of uh, Colorado's uh, neural network history. So I will pass it back to you, Mike. Oh, I'm not hearing you. I'm now unmuted, sorry, thank you. Um, I will uh, share one slide just to kind of wrap up this part of our segment on some of the ideas I think are very important in addition to the ones Paul talked about. Um, I'm not gonna go into presenter mode if you don't mind, you'll just see my slide with all the messiness. Uh, let's see. How's that? Looks good. Okay, cool. Um, this was, I tried to make a catalog of special sauce and uh, it in, definitely includes uh, the material that Paul presented. I wanted to mention a few other things too. Uh, modern neural nets are massively over-parameterized systems. There's many more weights than there are examples and you can load a neural network with arbitrary training sets. You can change the labels on an image classification task and it will memorize those labels just fine. And we always used to believe that when models have that much flexibility, you could never generalize well. And so the classic view, this slide that everyone had in a machine learning course is, as you make your model more complicated, as you have more units or hidden layers or parameters, the model training error drops and you build a model that learns a training set better. But at some point, the test performance goes back up because the model starts to memorize the training data and it doesn't learn regularities in the data. And um, this is the belief that is sort of the classic statistical view. And the version of this that's emerging both through theory and empirical studies is that there is this weird point where test error does rise, but then it drops back down as you, as you train a network. So not only is it correct, but it memorizes every little thing in the training set. And it's partly a function of the way neural nets are trained and um, there are certain conditions under which it happens, and this is a developing area, but it's really what has enabled the kind of models that are producing the kind of very public successes. These are gigantic models that are much larger than the data sets they're trained on, even though the data sets themselves are very large. Um, there's a number of tricks that have emerged over the years that sometimes make a difference, sometimes don't. Uh, batch norm would be probably my favorite trick that I hate that really does seem to condition deep networks. And then the rest of this list are just um, particular ideas that seem pretty important that um, I believe will stand the test of time. So Paul mentioned transformers um, that depend on this query key attention mechanism. And it's useful not only for language models, but visual reasoning and doing temporal credit assignment. There's generative adversarial networks that can create very lifelike images that everyone's probably seen in the popular press. Paul mentioned graph neural nets for doing causal and structured reasoning and normalizing flows, another scheme for doing invertible generative models. So that would be my list of stuff that's going on in the field right now that people should pay attention to. And if I've forgotten things, Folks should chime up in the chat. Would like to hear what you think. So I'll turn it back to Tammy then. All right. Thank you, uh, Mike and Paul. We have some uh, questions that we collected during registration, and some questions that have been coming in through the chat and the Q and A. So, Mike, here's one for you. Please discuss explainable neural networks. If a law is passed that a neural network decisions are to be explainable, how can we get there? So I'm gonna answer this question more as a psychologist than a, a machine learning person. 
What explainable means to humans is that there's a story you can understand. If people are asked to explain their own behavior, they make up a story. And we know that because there are these beautiful psychological experiments showing that factors that you think are influencing your behavior and your decisions really aren't, and factors that you would never believe has in, have influenced you are actually very important in, in your decision-making, statistically speaking. So what we really want in an explanation is something that we feel we kind of grok the, the meaning of. And to my mind, that means the way to do explainable AI is not to open up the networks and understand every last weight in the network, but to come up with a good story, to build networks that tell stories about other networks. And that's basically what goes on in our brain. The, the sort of the decision-making apparatus in our brains is separate from the, the storytelling apparatus that observes the IO behavior of, of our actual decision-making. Um, and then comes up with a story about it. And we're pretty good at telling those stories because we have so many years of experience watching our own behavior. But again, there are limitations to what sort of introspective access we have. Um, I was chatting with Paul about this earlier and he pointed out the the really important factor here is that these explanations aren't causal in nature. There's a separation between the explanation and the and the actual behavior. And that reminded me very much of work Paul had done in the 80s. Uh, he has a very famous paper called On the Proper Treatment of Connectionism that talks about different levels. There's the sort of sub-symbolic or neural level and the symbolic level. Um, and we understand symbolic stories. Symbolic stories are like linguistic stories and, and express things in these discrete elements in their <clears throat> relationships. Whereas the neural net goop is all, no one can figure out what's going on there. And Paul's um, argument in that is that symbolic stories are, or symbolic models are an approximation to what a neural net is doing. A neural net can do these very subtle behaviors through the continuous computation, continuous weights. And you can abstract that away to a symbolic story that captures some of the behavior of the neural network um, but it doesn't capture all of it. And it's really that sort of symbolic, sub-symbolic distinction that I think will lead to good explanations. But in order for that to happen, we need to be able to appreciate that the two don't have to be causally linked and we have to accept that. Um, can I ask Bobby to jump in? Because he had also, as, as uh, an ACM president, has had to deal with issues in AI and, and sort of philosophical things like this. Bobby, are you out there? You're muted, Bobby. I was going to say I am, but I have no business answering questions like this when you and Paul are around. Just two quick ones. We're starting to see uh, neural deep learning algorithms used in ways that are coming up in courts. And there, the uh, what the courts are interested in is something maybe more mundane than the discussion we were just having, which is, is there an algorithm here that they can explain so that they know how you got from point A to point B and can defend whether it's okay or not? So there's a legal aspect to explainable AI. There's something at the other end of the spectrum where people think that, oh, if it can take all this input and come out with this output, the things in the middle must mirror all the things that go on in the human brain. And so people are wondering if there's any truth to that, which you two guys can comment. I'm not aware that anybody's ever shown that's the case yet. And in fact, Bobby, one of our questions is how much closer has deep learning of the past two decades brought us to understanding human cognition or general AI? Any comments, Mike or Paul? Well, Mike, um, has uh, much more expertise in this area, but um, there are certainly um, people who believe that uh, the internal representations learned by deep neural networks that are doing image processing, that are doing uh, object classification, for example, um, are the best, best accounts we currently have of actual internal neural representations uh, for visual uh, object recognition as well. So I don't know if you buy, if you buy that, Mike, but that's certainly been um, 
advocated by people who compare the, the success um, with uh, other models uh, that have been around longer uh, for generating what we thought were the important visual features or whatever, and, and, and the neural nets just blow them out of the water for explaining the neural data. For vision only. Yeah, and I think that's really important, Tammy, because the limitation of current neural networks is they tend to be a single system end to end and what we really need to model human cognition or cognitive architectures and think about interacting components. And I see that as a trend in where the field is headed, at least <laughs> by people I work with. <laughs> um, but it, it definitely, I think there's an appreciation we need to build larger models that are doing multiple tasks and have multiple sorts of expertise, um, not just perception, but perception and language. And when we build these more complex articulated systems that have different modules that are doing these different functions, there seems like more hope of matching that to human cognition in, in all its richness, not just what happens in the first 200 milliseconds of vision. And so Mike, how does in your mind, how does that relate or not relate to a lot of what we're seeing in terms of multimodal modeling? Um, definitely to the extent that you benefit from multiple modalities and multiple signals at once. Um, I can give you one for instance of that, how it can change our views of, of what's being computed. So every object recognition model right now takes 2D images and maps it to you know, labels or does scene segmentation. There's no acknowledgement that the world out there is three-dimensional. And if you look at our brains, very early in the first couple hundred milliseconds, we, we extract information at least about what's in front of what, what's occluding what. Um, a lot of the gestalt phenomena have to do with this sort of segmenting the world and into depth planes. And a hypothesis, I think, is worth exploring and we're starting to explore is whether adding depth to models, like sort of before it starts to do vision, if we have a little module that just recovers depth from 2D images, is that gonna help various visual tasks? And the evidence we have so far is that it does. So that's one very simple example of sort of, it's not multiple modalities, but it's extracting information of one type and integrating it with RGB pixels, which are the things everyone else uses for vision. Thank you. I think that I go think ahead. that one. Sorry. I said go. Um, I thought uh, an interesting aspect of what uh, you just asked about and what Mike had said uh, about the need to go beyond models that are very focused on one task, uh, especially one mode uh, modality, um, is that. Uh, the, the holy grail of machine learning is to learn the really abstract concepts and relationships that cognition uh, makes so much use of. Um, and uh, if a system has to generate representations that are gonna serve visual purposes and linguistic purposes and reasoning purposes, then I think the, the pressures for those uh, representations to find the more abstract uh, structure out there um, that is amodal uh, is greater. And so it may be a necessary step on the roads to more general intelligence and more um, general purpose knowledge uh, acquisition. Paul, thank you for that. We have a, a somewhat related question uh, for you. Uh, it appears that current, current neural net architectures are still not capable of common sense and imagination processes. So what work is going on currently to think out of the, outside the box and understand and model these types of cognitive processes? Um, I'm not sure that I have anything uh, very, um, very uh, pointed to say about that. Um, uh, I, I do think that uh, Mike mentioned the um, visual, uh, the drawings, um, 
the visual art that has been produced by generative adversarial networks, GANs. Um, um, and when I look at them, I think, wow, you know, that's great imagination. The way that <laughs> all these different aspects uh, of recognizable parts of the visual world have been woven into this tapestry is really um, quite stunning. Um, and uh, so that's a kind of creativity. Um, it could be that uh, if we applied, maybe Mike knows about this, we, maybe work, you did work on this, I know, uh, long ago, uh, whether if GANs were applied to learning about music instead of visual uh, images, uh, maybe you would see some equally creative uh, compositions emerging from them. Um, that's something that's waiting to be done if it hasn't already been done. Yeah, if it hasn't been done, it'll be on archive next week, I suspect. Um, <laughs> Paul, I wanted your reaction. Have you seen OpenAI's Dolly? And I'll share the screen with folks just so people can see some of these images if they haven't. Um, but what's interesting about Dolly is that it takes a textual description and generates images. So it is doing the kind of multimodal mm -hmm. integration Paul mentioned. And it sure feels like it's, it's much more interesting than an uh, image classification system. So here it's told an armchair in the shape of an avocado and it generates this, or a storefront that has the word open AI written on it. These are the outputs. What do you think, Paul? Um, well, I think well, I would like some of those chairs. <laughs> <laughs> I would like some of them. Um, uh, well, I, I'm always speechless when I see what GPT-3 does. And this is another order of, uh, of sophistication beyond just generating stories. Um, and I, I'm just speechless. I don't know what to say. It's, it's just, just astounding. Yeah, the, num the number of times I see results and I'm speechless as well. You know, stuff I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. It's cool. I'm not sure how to stop sharing Oh, you're stopped, Mike. Okay. Yeah. So we, we have a lot of questions basically around applications and impact. So Mike and Paul, what, what do you see as the biggest obstacles in the next decade to the widespread use of deep learning? Well, I mean, I guess it's a, a little bit um, glib, but I would say the biggest obstacle is artificial stupidity. I mean, um, these, these networks that, uh, for example, GPT-3, um, uh, which can, you start a story and it just takes off with it and generates all sorts of lovely English and colorful language and um, very fluent. Um, and uh, you get the impression that surely there's some understanding of the story that you set up and the story that it was continuing. And then it starts saying things that reveal, it, it can't possibly know what the hell it's talking about. No way can it. Um, and so basically, uh, these are like idiot savants that, and, and they're also exploiting our ability to project intelligence into systems that don't have it. Um, and so I, I think that the biggest problem is overestimating uh, the knowledge that these systems have and just trusting them or not even trusting them, just asking them to do things that are just way out of their league. Um, that's my perspective. I have nothing to add to that. That's exactly what I would have said. Not as well. We have a, a lot of graduate students in the audience today, and they are asking for your advice. So what advice do you have for current students who want to pursue a career in machine learning? My advice is math, math, math. I, I saw Jim Curry is in the audience, uh, applied math. Professor, I guess now computer science. I, I'm not sure what's happened since I left. We got lucky. Um, but uh, yeah, the more math you have, the better. Statistics, linear algebra. Paul, Paul's a, a physicist by training. That situated him really well. I'm a dopey psychologist by training. It situated me really poorly. <laughs> uh, au contraire. Au contraire. I would, I would compliment your uh, advice, which I in thoroughly endorse. Uh, by saying that 
Uh, at the same time, people should not neglect uh, a, a number of areas uh, that we have, you and I both benefited a lot from having studied so psychology, um, uh, physics in a, in a sort of indirect way, but language, linguistics in a more direct way. Um, so, um, you know, even, even just not limiting your horizons uh, to what came out uh, on archive since 2020 uh, is already a step that takes you way beyond most people. So, um, you know, m so many of the uh, ideas that really uh, have taken off in the deep learning era were ideas that were developed in the 80s and 90s. You should look at those things. You should read those papers because there's a treasure trove of ideas there um, that are waiting to be given uh, the big boost that current uh, computational and uh, data uh, resources allow. Um, but I would go further than that. I mean, if you're interested in doing language processing, I think you should uh, study linguistics. I mean, there are many people who have said that, well, the, these, every time we try to put linguistics into natural language processing NLP systems, it deteriorates their performance. Um, uh, linguistics is now dead. Um, and uh, there's some, certainly some truth to that. But I think that the job of linguistics has shifted now. It's for getting us to understand how GPT-3 can possibly be doing what the hell it's doing. I mean, um, it's stupid, but it's fluent. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, how can it be that good at the just syntactic, uh, lexical knowledge of language? Um, and I think we need the insights about language that linguists have and the theories that we can bring to bear to now move to an era of understanding what these models can do. Um, and in the process, we're gonna learn a lot about language we didn't know and a lot about like, what linguistic theory needs to morph into, um, led by these new models that do things differently than we've ever thought was possible. Uh, so uh, that's just one example where I think that um, beyond the math, which is absolutely the foundation of, of everything, beyond that, uh, there are important aspects of cognitive science that are going to make a huge difference uh, in the future. And so you should expose yourself to them as well. I wanna underline that in the future part, I think in the short term, if your job is to go out next month and get a job at some sweet spot in industry, it's, it's hard to find folks who have an appreciation for cognitive science. I, I completely agree with Paul in the long term that that's what's gonna make the field successful. That's what's gonna to lead to general AI. And Paul has it as his mission to bring linguistic theory to MSR. I have it as my mission to bring psychological data and experimental work to Google. And um, you can ask us in a few years how successful we've been in winning over our colleagues. I was gonna mention that, one that was, other- that was that was well worded, Mike. Don't ask us now how it's going. <laughs> I was going to mention one other thing in answer to the question Tammy asked, which is at CU, there's many really great opportunities to do machine learning applications. Um, so folks who aren't trying to develop new machine learning methods, new forms of inductive bias, understanding operation of, of models and why they learn, but rather just uh, have really interesting problems. And a lot of times, you come up with new ideas about machine learning from the problem domain perspective. So um, don't underestimate the value of hooking up with professors who have problems they want to solve and need a young energetic person to go off and learn TensorFlow and download the right pre-trained model to play with. Absolutely. Well, you both set up uh, our next question very, very well. It is about cognitive science itself. In the early to mid eighties, there was a debate about whether cognitive science should become its own department based discipline in a university settings that trains students or whether cognitive science was better suited as institutes that serve multiple departments. UC San Diego went the department route and Colorado went the institute route. With nearly 40 years of hindsight, what did the different models yield? 
Paul is chair of a cognitive science department, so I will let him answer. Uh, well, um, I, I do believe in, uh, I guess I'm just invested in, in being in a cognitive science department and having put a lot of work into trying to build a cognitive science program that creates true cognitive scientists at the end, um, that that calls for a department. Um, I do believe though that um, the cross-fertilization between disciplines is uh, sufficiently uh, fertile that uh, cross-department institutes uh, can benefit the research that's done in the different departments uh, uh, a lot. Um, so um, the psychology you do is better if you also are learning about uh, artificial intelligence and the, the language that you, linguistics you do is better if you're uh, learning about uh, natural language processing. And so I think that but it, the sort of links between disciplines can carry a lot of very constructive information flow. Uh, so um, the result may not be uh, producing graduate students who now become cognitive scientists in my sense of the word, uh, but they're multidisciplinary scientists um, within the cognitive sciences. And uh, I think there's uh, an important role to be played by both of those models. So that's a non-answer. Well done, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we only have two minutes. Do either of you have any parting comments to add to our audience? Well, um, sometimes I think about it this way. Um, in cognitive science, we have different types of intelligence systems that we've studied. We study uh, adults, we study brain damaged adults, we study infants, some of us study animals. And these are all wonderful cognitive systems to enrich our theory of cognition in the large. Um, and now we have a new one. We have these AI systems and we can study them as cognitive scientists. It's a, it's a, a, a kind of more, a once in a many lifetimes event when a new kind of cognition appears. And it, there's a lot of artificial stupidity in there but there's also a lot of cognition in there and we need to sort that out and figure it out. And I think that's a really exciting time. So that's one way of thinking about it. Mike, your parting thoughts? Um, I guess I wanna echo what Paul said in the sense that it's nice to have people out there who reflect on networks and really care about what's going on inside of them and don't treat them like black boxes where you download a software package and run the tool. And I'm worried about folks who are too trusting, who just uh, apply these things sort of willy-nilly without really doing the reality check as to whether they're behaving the way we want and whether you can construct a toy data set that you know exactly what the right answer is and your model better be doing that. So uh, I encourage especially students to be more reflective of the systems they're applying. Skeptical users. So thank you both very much. Um, I, we're receiving a lot of appreciation and love for the great hour we just spent together. Um, I'll hand it back to Bobby. And this is a time when it's really sad to be virtual because otherwise we would have thunderous applause. <laughs> so instead we just have thunderous virtual applause. But thank you all so much. Thanks everybody for joining us. We had about 300 people joining us. And I just want to let you know a couple things. We will have a second event of this type on April 22nd, featuring professors Gerhard Fischer and Clayton Lewis doing a somewhat analogous talk about the growth of HCI in its past, present, and future. And all of you will be getting an announcement of that very soon. There will be a recording of this webinar, uh, and you'll get a link to that as soon as it's available as well. And finally, we've announced recently that computer science has set up an endowed scholarship fund to uh, support future students in honor of founding faculty such as Paul and Mike. So if anybody wants to uh, help with that, you'll get information about that as well. So uh, Tammy, Paul, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, 
this is uh you can't pay enough for something like you just did for the last hour it was wonderful and, uh, and thank you thank you thank very you much. All.